Welcome back to Disturbed Reality. Ivan Velasquez Caballero, aka El Taliban, was one of the most feared Losetta's commanders during his time in the organization. The government of Mexico listed Velasquez Caballero in 2009 as one of its most wanted drug lords and was offering up to 2.5 million US dollars for information leading to his capture. On the 24th of March 2010, the United States Department of the Treasury sanctioned Velasquez Caballero under the Kingpin Act for his involvement in drug trafficking along with 53 other international criminals and 10 foreign entities. The Act prohibited US citizens and companies from doing any kind of business activity with him and virtually froze all of his assets in the USA. Ivan Velasquez Caballero was born on the 10th of February 1970 in the border city of Nueva Laredo in Tamaulipas and was born to a working class family. During his childhood, he befriended Miguel Trevino Morales, who would later become the leader of Los Etas and his fierce rival. When he was 14 years old and desperate for money, Velasquez Caballero initiated his criminal career by stealing cars in Nueva Laredo, and at the age of 22, he was imprisoned at the La Loma Penitentiary for car theft. Upon his release, he was then introduced to Cartel del Golfo under the recommendation of his childhood friend, Miguel Trevino Morales, who, at the time, was an up-and-coming trafficker within the Gulf Cartel. Miguel Trevino would then begin to work with the Gulf Cartel armed wing, Los Etas, and Ivan Velasquez Caballero would follow him. Ivan quickly impressed then Los Eta leader Heriberto Lascano, which was a rarity as Heriberto tended to hand responsibility to fellow former army members. Ivan Velasquez Caballero became a major financial operator and money launderer for Los Etas. Unlike the original members of Los Etas who joined the organization in the 1990s, Velasquez Caballero was not a former member of the Mexican Armed Forces. He is one of a few to rise to the leadership of the group who was not a military deserter. As Velasquez Caballero rose through the Los Etas organization, he changed his code name from El 50 to the nickname El Taliban, a likely reference to the beheading techniques practiced by Los Etas and the Islamist group. It said that the beheading method of execution entertained and satiated Ivan's bloodlust. As the years passed and Ivan continued to impress his superiors, he then became the regional boss of Los Etas in Nueva Laredo and was eventually sent to the state of Zacatecas in 2007, where he reportedly had around 400 Sicarios at his beck and call to protect him, conduct missions, and to carry out hits. Eventually, in 2010, Los Etas would split from the Gulf Cartel, and the two former allies would engage in a five-year-long bloody war, which would eventually decimate both cartels. As well as the war with the Gulf Cartel, by 2012, Los Etas also began to suffer serious internal conflict amongst its leaders. The infighting between two factions in Los Etas, one led by Heriberto Lascano, aka El Lasca, and the other led by Miguel Trevino Morales, aka Z40, reportedly began in mid-2012. It's speculated that at some point in time, Ivan lost trust in his childhood friend Miguel and was actively working alongside Heriberto Lascano to kill Miguel Trevino Morales. Amid the power struggle between the two Zeta leaders, Velasquez Caballero supposedly distanced himself from Los Zetas and decided to join forces with the Knights Templar Cartel and elements of the Gulf Cartel, the Zetas' former allies, to put down Trevino Morales, 
who he deemed as a traitor. He would then go on to create his own splinter faction, of course, named after himself, called Los Talibanes. In late 2011, Ivan Velasquez Caballero had announced his discontent for Miguel Trevino Morales through a series of public banners left behind in several parts of northeastern Mexico and by uploading several videos on YouTube where he accused him of setting up the arrests and deaths of his own men. The Talibanes group was born in the state of Tamaulipas and allegedly were in cahoots with the Tamaulipas State Police, who supported them in their war with Miguel Trevino Morales loyalists, essentially giving them free reign to grow in the area, allowing them to increase their influence and power. It is generally believed that despite denouncing Miguel Trevino Morales, Ivan remained close with Heriberto Lascano and still worked within his side of Los Etas. The Mexican Navy, along with the collaborated intelligence effort of the DEA, arrested Velasquez Caballero on the 26th of September 2012 in the state of San Luis Potosi without firing a single bullet. He was arrested with two other men, and the Mexican Marines confiscated two cars, 12 kilograms of marijuana, several guns, grenades, and 20 grand in cash. The following day, he was paraded in front of cameras, handcuffed and wearing a bulletproof vest, and was escorted by masked marines carrying assault rifles. Stacks of cash, weapons and seized narcotics were on display on the table in front of him, where reporters took pictures of the drug lord. He stood there with a stern face as the navy accused him of several charges. According to initial reports issued by the Navy, Ivan Velasquez Caballero had controlled the operations of the cartel in the city of Monterrey in northern Mexico, and worked as a leader of Los Etas in the states of San Luis Patosi, Zacatecas, Aguasalientes, Guanajuato, and Nueva Leon. During his interrogation, Ivan admitted that his income was around $30 million a month, although 70% of it went to operational expenses, such as payments for policemen, equipment and food, and wages for members of his organization. The capture of Ivan likely wasn't due to a sophisticated sting operation, but more than likely he was set up and ratted out. One likely informant behind the arrest is Jorge Costilla Sanchez, who was a top leader of the Gulf Cartel following the arrest and extradition of former leader Osiel Cardenas. Jorge was arrested just two weeks before Ivan, and more than likely was collaborating with the authorities by giving them information. He could have also been betrayed by his own men, who, for whatever reason, might have decided that they were more willing to back Miguel Trevino Morales. Velasquez Caballero was extradited to the United States and made his initial court appearance in Laredo, Texas on the morning of the 22nd of November 2013. He pled not guilty to the drug trafficking and money laundering charges. On the 21st of July 2017, Ivan was sentenced to 30 years in prison by a federal judge in Laredo, Texas, and was also ordered to forfeit $10 million in drug proceeds. According to US officials, he is expected to be deported from the US to Mexico after the completion of his sentence. As the name suggests, Los Talibanes were responsible for much violence in Mexico in the early 2010s, they were one of the most powerful cartel splinter factions for a short period of time. They do currently still operate, though they are no longer the force that they once were. They still have a presence in Zacatecas, where they seem to have allied to Cartel de Sinaloa and have been supporting them in their war against CJNG in the States. 
they also have a presence in the state of San Luis Potosi. Interestingly, in the years following the arrest of El Taliban, I've also been informed that Los Talibanes have had an internal dispute of their own. It's alleged that some members pledged allegiance to Cartel del Noreste, and this may explain CDN's presence in Zacatecas, which of course was a former Talibanes territory. Following the release of the infamous Zacatecas flaying video on the 22nd of June 2023, it is possible that the perpetrators behind the horrific murder may have been linked to Los Talibanes, or at least potentially, they were former members. Please note, this is just speculation on my behalf, and information surrounding the Talibanes internal dispute is purely from word of mouth, and not tangible online resources. Essentially, it is said by some in the know that as of right now, there are two Talibanes groups, one of which is allied to Sinaloa, and the other being allied to Cartel del Noreste. Los Talibanes, much like other cartel groups, have been involved in the recording and distribution of extremely graphic propaganda footage. Just like the Taliban, their favoured method of execution has tended to be beheadings. While there isn't many, one of the calling cards of Los Talibanes is the quality of the videos that they release. Usually, they are as close to HD as you're going to get with cartel videos. But nevertheless, let's take a look at three videos involving Los Talibanes, two of which they were the perpetrators, and one in which an alleged Talibanes member was the victim. It's unclear as to when exactly these clips were released, though I'd estimate that they all came out in and around the mid-2010s. The first video is that of a supposed Gulf Cartel member being executed by Los Talibanes members. The video is just under 5 minutes in length, and is shot in the middle of the night in a wooded area. As you play the video, you see the victim, who is a young man on his knees, with his hands tied behind his back. It also appears that his hood has been duct taped to his head to act as a blindfold. Multiple Sicarios surround him, and one is pointing a gun that appears to have a grenade launcher attachment at his head. It is likely that the video was filmed somewhere in San Luis Potosi. He is interrogated and grilled for over three minutes. The interrogator has had his voice disguised, which makes him sound robotic. He asks several questions, and the captive spills the beans on who he works with. He confirms that he works with Cartel del Golfo, and also sheds light on certain individuals from the organisation. He also mentions that his crew is sponsored and supported by the local police force, and he gives the alias of a police officer by the name of El Gordo. After around three and a half minutes of interrogation, the victim's time is up. A Sicario then enters shot carrying a machete. He pulls the hood off the victim's head, places the blade under his throat, and tries to slice away. The victim panics and dives onto the ground as he pleads for his life. No, 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 Hefecito, he exclaims as he tries to ball up to protect his throat. The sound of panic and fear in the victim's voice is apparent. The interrogator, who I'm assuming is also the cameraman, tells the victim to shut up. The victim bravely tries to protect himself by tucking his chin so that his throat isn't exposed. The Sicario wrestles with him and tries to pull his head up, though the victim continues to fight for his life the best he can. Frustrated, the Sicario then pushes the victim onto his chest, who is still pleading for his life, and he proceeds to use the machete to slice the back of the victim's neck. 
He then makes one final plea for his life and states, No, I don't do this. I'll put another pull on them. I'll put another pull on them. I'm not sure what he's referring to here. After the Sicario starts cutting the back of the victim's neck, he then instinctively raises his head, which gives the Sicario the opportunity to place the machete blade under the victim's throat. He proceeds to cut, and it is apparent that the blade is razor sharp. In a matter of seconds, the machete slices into the victim's throat, creating a horrible gurgling sound. I always find it hard to explain this sound, but it almost sounds like the noise somebody would make if they are drinking from a straw and there isn't much drink left in the cup. It's a weird, violent, bubbling, sucking type of sound. The Sicario grunts as he cuts the victim's throat and uses his fingers to sink into the victim's eye sockets to pull the victim's head back. Eventually, the groaning and gurgling stops. The victim's body is then turned over, and you see more clearly how deep the Sicario has cut into his throat. He's cut down to the spinal cord. Once the victim has been turned over, his severed windpipe starts to make hissing type sounds, and you see the blood from the carterid artery shoot up in the air in steady bursts, matching the heartbeats of the victim. The hissing type sounds continue as the Sicario then uses the machete to cut through the victim's spinal cord. He chops down and you hear the blade connect with the spine, which makes a clanking, cracking type of sound. The cameraman then makes a sound of admiration and excitement as the Sicario continues to carry out the heinous act. The hissing sound continues as the video then ends. The quality of this clip is surprisingly clear, despite it possibly being 7 or 8 years old. The second clip once again purports Los Talibanes executing a supposed Gulf Cartel member. The video is just under 4 minutes in length, and once again has been shot in the dead of night in a wooded area. The interrogator in the video sounds exactly the same as in the previous video, which makes it likely that the two clips were uploaded in and around the same time period. The victim is kneeling on the ground with his hands tied together. The first couple of minutes is once again your standard cartel interrogation. The captive confirms that he works for the Gulf Cartel, and also once again name drops a man by the name of El Gordo, who supposedly is a police officer. The interrogator asks him what do they want to do to Los Talibanes, and the victim responds that they want them out of Zacatecas. You then hear one of the hitmen hock phlegm from his throat, and he then spits at the victim. The Sicario then asks, what do you want to tell your mates? And the victim responds in defiance, I have nothing else to say. The interrogator then states, to all of the fucking sluts, fucking Carlilos, you're still dogs, and death is coming, motherfuckers. A Sicario then enters shot, once again carrying a machete. He pulls the victim down onto his back and slices his throat. Though, the victim doesn't scream once, but you hear the all too familiar gurgling sound as his throat is cut. The camera fixates on the victim's face for only a few seconds. His pupils dilate as his throat is being cut, and you see the life leave his eyes. The video then ends quickly and displays a threatening message for their rivals and the police that goes against them. The last clip has been recommended to be covered for a while, and it depicts the execution, this time, of a supposed Los Talibanes member by Los Zetas. Once again, it is unclear as to when the clip was released, but possibly it is older than the previous two as the quality isn't as clear. The clip itself was recorded in the state of Zacatecas. 
As you play the video, you see the captive who is kneeling down on the floor with his hands tied behind his back. He is surrounded by multiple heavily armed Losetta Sicarios. He is being held captive in some kind of room, and Tarp has been hung against the wall and laid on the ground, possibly to assist in cleanup after a potential execution. The victim is interrogated by the Zeta gunman, and he confirms that Los Talibanes have support of the local police in the state of Zacatecas. At around 1 minute and 40 seconds into the video, a heavy set man enters shot. He walks in front of the camera and then next to the victim. He then pulls a hunting knife from a sheath that is on his waist and holds it up to the camera in a somewhat theatrical fashion. He approaches the victim and then pulls his hair back to raise his head and then attempts to cut his throat. The captive violently struggles, he growls and pleads for his life. He balls up and tries to protect his throat, but this only prompts the executioner to start cutting the back of the victim's neck. One of the other Sicarios then places his foot on the victim in an attempt to pin him down. The Sicario begins to attempt to slice the back of the victim's neck, but struggles for a while to get contact on the blade. Eventually he does, and slices into the flesh, and you hear a haunting scream. I say scream, but it sounds more animalistic, almost like the sound cats would make when they are fighting. After the initial scream, the victim makes what sounds to be a quiet panting type sound. You get the impression that the victim is about to pass out as the back of his neck is being cut. Blood begins to leak onto the black tarp on the ground. The victim stops struggling, he goes limp, and it gives the Sicarios the impression that they can move him to then cut his throat. They move the victim to get an angle on his neck, and all of a sudden, the victim jolts into life, screaming no, and pleading for his life. This actually disturbs the Sicarios and makes them jump. The victim jolts onto his back, looking his eventual killer in the eyes, pleading with him as blood is covered around his face and neck. Once again, he tries to protect the front of his neck by rolling onto his stomach. Multiple Sicarios then hold him down, as the killer resumes to slicing the back of his neck. The victim makes a horrible whining, crying type sound as the blade slices deeper into the flesh. The captive at this point has moved the tarp due to his struggles and has exposed the white tile floor beneath. The hitman then slices the side of the captive's neck, possibly severing the carteret artery as blood begins to flow violently, covering the white tiled floor. The victim continues to scream and groan in pain as the killer slices the side of his neck. The video ends as the victim is still alive. It is possible that there is a longer version of this video, as I have seen descriptions of it online stating that they eventually decapitate him and throw him into plastic bags, which indicates a longer version may exist, possibly even showing a dismemberment. It appears, from watching the video, that the Sicario performing the execution was possibly inexperienced as he struggled throughout, and appeared very disturbed when the victim suddenly jolted and screamed for his life. I'm sure there are further videos online featuring Los Talibanes, but these are the ones that I found. But anyway, that is the video. I hope you enjoyed it, if you can enjoy this sort of content. I know for some who follow this channel that the cases I selected today won't be among the most graphic I've covered, though, as far as I'm concerned, all of these videos are reprehensible to say the least, but I just wanted to cover Los Talibanes as it's an organisation slash splinter cell, splinter faction that I've not yet touched upon. 
I myself haven't really researched this particular group until basically the Zacatecas flaying video as a couple of people suggested to me that those involved may have been former Los Talibanes members. Again, how true that is, I don't know. That is purely just word of mouth uh, and I'm going by what some people have told me. So yeah, I just wanted to share some context and information on this particular group. Also one more thing, a question I get asked a lot, um, and this is totally off topic, so a bit of a PSA, as, as cringe as that sounds, but I get asked a lot, am I ever going to collab with other channels in quote unquote the true crime slash horror slash disturbing content community and honestly at this point in time I've kind of seen enough that I'll say no to that. Um, ultimately you guys know my goal. My goal, or not even a goal because it's so, it's so out there and unrealistic but my ambition is to go to Mexico and actually get to cover this first hand. Uh, in doing so for that to happen I would obviously have to link up with another outlet uh, because I have no contacts in Mexico. I'm not a, a film producer. I mean, I, I can barely edit the videos I edit and I don't exactly do a good job. But that is my goal. And in regards to collabing with other creators in this space, barring a couple of exceptions, I don't really think it's a good idea for me. I, I, I never joined YouTube to get into the I scratch your back, you scratch mine mindset. I'm not interested. Um, and quite frankly, I'd rather just keep this professional. I want to be responsible for what I say and what I do. Basically, what I'm saying is I don't want to be dragged into nonsense. In regards to the subject matter, I take this seriously. And I think introducing potential problems down the line. Ultimately, it's not conducive of my ambitions for this whole channel. And you guys know my ambitions. I'd like to cover this firsthand. I'd like to try and shed some real light on what is going on. Ultimately, if I talk about what I talk about, if the opportunity comes up, I have to see it firsthand, right? Because if you're not willing to do that, then it becomes exploitative. So I'd love the opportunity to do so. And although it's super unrealistic, I still don't want to jeopardize any potential opportunities in the future. So as for collabing, quite frankly, I don't want to be dragged into the nonsense that can come with that. It just doesn't interest me. That being said, I am potentially looking at reaching out to real narco journalists and maybe we could try to get some people on to have conversations in regards to what is going on right now. Uh, I think I, I may start reaching out to these sort of guys in the very near future. Maybe we could put those sort of interviews on Rumble if we do them. I don't think I'll put them on this channel, but it's something I'm considering, you know, to try and get my head, try, try and get my foot in the door and, and, and seeing where that could take us. Because again, I am serious about, about my desires to see this firsthand. And by keep on saying it, I'm hoping I put a seed in the universe to make it happen. We shall see. But anyway, ignore my ramblings. Thank you guys for the support. It's much appreciated. If you guys could uh, check out the links in the pinned comments, follow me on Twitter, DM me if you have any case ideas, things of that nature. Uh, follow me on Twitch as well, where we kind of wind down and have fun. Yeah, check my links out. But anyway, as always... Stay safe, and I'll catch you on the next one.